Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live webcast titled Challenges in CMV Management. I'm Daniela Lucic of Abbott Molecular, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We're delighted to bring you to this educational webinar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Abbott Molecular. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the Q&A button, lower left hand corner. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left hand corner of your web page and follow the process for obtaining your credits. I would like to now introduce today's speaker. Dr. David Hilliard is a professor of pathology at the University of Utah School of Medicine and medical director of molecular infectious diseases at AUP Laboratories. Dr. Hilliard received his medical degree from Columbia University. His training was in anatomic and clinical pathology with fellowship in medical microbiology and microbial genetics. Dr. Hilliard is world-renowned KOL with over 80 peer-reviewed publications and numerous chapters and review articles. I will now turn it over to Dr. Hilliard for his presentation. Welcome to today's teleconference. Today we'll be discussing the important role and challenges for molecular testing in the management of CMV infection. Our learning objectives are to take an overview of the role of NAT testing in the management of CMV, to consider the value of CMV test standardization, and look at recent insights into the challenge of CMV standardization and implications for other viral load tests. I must say I was tempted to add another learning objective, and that would be to appreciate a fascinating unfolding scientific mystery that impacts one of the most important areas of molecular ID testing. Indeed, that's the story I'll be reviewing with you today. I have two disclosures to give, a uh, consultation to Abbott Diagnostics and Roche Diagnostics shown on this slide. The content of this presentation is consistent with all applicable FDA requirements for approved assays. It has long been appreciated that immune suppression, whatever its root causes, places individuals at risk for serious pathogen infection. We now know about many primary genetic defects causing uh, immune suppression. We've known for some time about the vulnerability of neonates and the premature infants for immune suppression and therefore pathogen infection. HIV patient immune suppression is another famous story, uh, as well as that of cancer patients who are put on a variety of immune suppressive regimens. And probably the one that is most relevant to this presentation is that of the situation for transplant patients. One of the most significant developments in laboratory medicine in the last 10 to 15 years has been the use of various molecular technologies to guide the management of care for immune compromised individuals. A common theme is that pathogens which often pose extreme risk to immune suppressed individuals can be detected and quantified at early stages of disease and followed quantitatively in order to assess response to therapy. This approach leads to a much more refined and effective personalized level of care. It should be recognized that immune suppression actually appears in several different settings. This presentation will focus on the use of molecular technology for management of transplant patients and the development of molecular test methods and algorithms for their care. Molecular and, of course, traditional tests fit into a very complex landscape of testing. 
I like this slide by Fishman, which illustrates a rough sequence of events in transplant patient care, highlighting stages of care and windows of risk. Clearly, CMV is not the only pathogen that transplant patients are at risk for. However, it's a very important one, and its study has contributed enormously to the management of other types of infection. A key concept is that the period of most intense immune suppression is the stage in which patients are at greatest risk for any of these pathogens. Just as institutions usefully rely on different immunotherapy protocols, they also benefit from shared experience in detection and quantification of these organisms, and test standardization or non-standardization has become a major issue. It's worth remembering something about CMV epidemiology, and that it is a ubiquitous infection. Uh, humans are the only reservoir, and about 60 to 80 percent of adults become seropositive, not only in this country, but worldwide. In immune-suppressed patients, CMV is capable of causing serious infection in many different organs. I well remember as a young pathologist in training performing a post-mortem on an individual who had presented with CNS symptoms with toxoplasma infection diagnosed on a frozen section biopsy. This was shortly before HIV had been identified, and mysterious cases appearing in New York City samples were taken for this post-mortem from virtually every body compartment. Remarkably, CMV was identified in the form of nuclear inclusions in almost every tissue. Indeed, full-blown CMV has many presentations in severely immune-compromised individuals, causing a variety of direct presentations. There are also many direct effects, as illustrated on the right side of this slide. These include a general change in immune modulation, uh, the immune suppressed state, uh, there is also an involvement in acute and chronic rejection. And importantly, it has been well documented that there are interactions with other viruses, including an acceleration of hepatitis C virus pathogenesis and evolution in uh, post-transplantation lymphoproliferative disease driven by Epstein-Barr virus. So CMB and immunocompromised hosts can be summarized by some of these general bullet points. First, the general features which are nonspecific in the patient's presentation, spiking fevers, myalgia, arthralgia. The key bullet point that disease presents at this stage of greatest immune compromise, that patients most at risk are those who are naive immunologically to CMV in the past, that is receiving a transplant from a CMV positive donor into a negative recipient. And then the very important concept that a large fraction of relevant disease happens due to secondary infection due to reactivation of latent virus. In this setting, and both in the context of hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, HSCT, and in solid organ allografts, one of the most important and life-threatening of the presentations is pneumonitis and obliterative bronchiolitis. Also in the case of solid organ allografts, it should be remembered that there is a large role in renal rejection as well. So the gravity of panlobular pneumonia or obliterative bronchiolitis driven by CMV is shown in this slide. You can see at the top the CMV inclusions that would have been seen in that autopsy in the HIV patient 30 years ago and are routinely seen by surgical pathologists in samples from the lung or from other body sites uh, for a first indication that CMV is involved. Now, what about laboratory tools for CMV diagnosis and patient monitoring? Clearly, we have had a timeline and a maturation of capabilities. For years, we used culture, looking either at white blood cells, especially buffy coats. Uh, we would look uh, by culture or uh, in combination with cytology into bronchial levages and other sample types. 
A intermediate before molecular testing was the development of the technology for antigenemia, in which case white cells were purified and then were exposed to monoclonal antibodies uh, that would stain the white cells if they were infected with CMV. At this point in time, and really for several years, most diagnostic testing has been driven by nucleic acid amplification and quantitative analysis out of very, various sample types. This is now the gold standard. And the important bullet point is that in order to make tests comparable one to another, we have been using an international standard which was released in October of 2010. So in the case of CMV disease in the transplant patient, there are a couple of general approaches. The first is antiviral prophylaxis. That is, we take a patient on a transplant unit and, uh, unit and put them uh, on antivirals from the get-go. Uh, the drug therapies would typically include valgancyclovir, uh, beginning an engraftment for divine periods of time up to 100 days. And uh, one of the downsides of this is that uh, putting all patients on this, given a risk of complications from bone marrow suppression, means that that entire population of patients would then have this risk. In addition, there may be consequences and implications for the evolution of resistance to CMD. The other approach is called preemptive therapy. Uh, in this case, uh, in the setting of asymptomatic infection, uh, defined levels of viremia detected by nucleic acid testing are determined. Surveillance testing is done typically once a week and for periods up to three months, although in patients, for instance, graft versus host disease settings and T cell deficiency settings, this surveillance testing can go on for long periods of time, up to a year. When viral loads for CMV have reached a defined threshold, then these patients are started on therapy, IV gancyclovir or oral valgancyclovir. And we've just, I've uh, highlighted at the bottom of this slide that it is so key that these be validated through research studies uh, to have drug therapy starting at predetermined viral load levels. Now, in this slide, we have a very old study that has been much cited that I think gives us great insight to how testing is done and also what some of the issues are. On the left side of the slide, we see from this patient cohort study average viral loads for patients that either uh, have CMV disease on the far left or are asymptomatic. And you can see that for CMV diseased patients, the average copy per mil for hepatitis C is about 55,000, whereas asymptomatic patients may still be positive but uh, have lower levels of cytomegalovirus, 1,800 in this case. Turning to the right panel, uh, the analysis of sensitivity, specificity, and positive predicted value is shown. And let's hone in on the positive and negative predicted value for patients for which uh, therapy initiated at different viral uh, load levels were taken. So at the bottom of the slide, for a cutoff of 20,000 copies per mil, the positive predictive value would be very high, 100% in this study. At 5,000 copies per mil, PPV at 64%. And closer to the cutoff levels that are routinely used now, the cutoff of 2,000 copies, the positive predictive value is 50%, the negative predictive value uh, 99%. So to summarize, preemptive therapy has been the dominant therapy for more than 20 years. It is the preferred strategy in most institutions. And in this review article by Solano and others that appeared very, very recently, a lot of data has shown that it's at least as effective as prophylaxis in preventing early CMB and organ disease. There's really wide agreement for this, as summarized in this article. 
Now, I've highlighted two other bullet points from this paper, and that is that the issue of the cutoff, low CMV viremia, uh, which can often be cleared by the host with no effects on patient survival, there is wide agreement for this notion. That is a patient who might have 200 copies or 300 copies or 800 copies. There's wide agreement for this, but at least there is far less data. And so in this, I think, important new article, uh, there is a highlighting of a new study to support withholding treatment until CMV reaches uh, about 1,500 international units per mil, which is also about 1,500 copies per mil, and data to show that this really has no detrimental effect on patient survival. We need to have accurate and comparable data for a number of reasons uh, in order to assess patients' clinical course. The application of shared knowledge from primary research and its translation into the clinical setting is another reason, very important reason, why tests should be standardized. And finally, uh, for guidelines to be created that can apply to a variety of institutions, we need to be care comparing apples to apples when we look at CMV viral loads compared to other CMV viral loads. So are we there? Were we ever there? Are we there now? That raises uh, a definition which is at the heart of comparable viral load testing, and that is the commutability of assays. So if you look in uh, the definition literature of the CLSI documentation, commutability is defined as the equivalence of the mathematical relationships among the results of different measurement procedures for a reference material and for representative samples of the type intended to be measured. Wow, that's really a mouthful. I think that language, as complex as it is, can really be boiled down to the central question. Can results from one test be applied to those from another test? So how do we calibrate a test to begin with? Shown at the top of this slide is a simple uh, crossing threshold plot in a real-time PCR assay. And you can see from the green line that as PCR proceeds, there's eventually signal above noise, a crossing threshold is determined for that sample. On the left bottom panel, we can see that these crossing thresholds can, in a dilution series in this case, be translated into a straight line if the results are log transformed, because PCR is intrinsically logarithmic in its amplification cycles. And then in the bottom right panel, we see that these dilution series uh, generated crossing thresholds with the uh, dilution series line, straight line, uh, plotted in blue, can then be compared to a, the crossing threshold from a sample of a known concentration shown in the green bars. So in this case, we have a sample that is known to have about 10,000 copies per mil, and if we intersect on the line and uh, go over to the left, we find that this corresponds to a crossing threshold of 25. And for those of you who aren't familiar with this, this is how all of our viral load tests are essentially calibrated. So for this, we need a calibration material, and indeed, for the reasons I've uh, listed, we need a commutable or a or a comparable calibration material, one that everybody can share and go through some form of this calibration process so that we report the same results. Uh, the results must be accurate, and the calibration material that is sent out month after month, year after year, must have the same definable concentrations that people can rely on. So, where have we been in the past? And I think the simple conclusion is best shown in this very well-known slide from uh, Pang et al., uh, published in Transplantation in 2009, where samples were sent out to 33 different laboratories. Uh, the samples consisted of serial dilutions, so one could look at high, medium, and low viral loads. It was the uh, material was spiked uh, nucleocapsid 
purified material spiked into plasma. And what is really shocking about this is shown numerically in the second bullet point, but you can see it best just looking visually. Here we have this material that should result in about a log three or 10,000 copies per mil, but in fact, there are interrogations where nothing is detected or just barely detected. And when we look around 3,000 copies per mil, we can see that there's just this tremendous spread. Thinking back to the cutoffs in the Humar paper, if we were to try to apply one set of rules and had testing done in various laboratories, an example, we would draw very, very different conclusions. Taking that information just from this middle range of values from the Pang 2009 study and transposing it onto that rock curve, you can see just how incredibly broad this spectrum is. It should also be pointed out that this just isn't a problem for very low samples, although things probably get more difficult for all PCR reactions at the low end, but also at the high end tests for some reason can't seem to get the same result uh, among different laboratories. So one of the solutions for this was to assume that the problem lay in the fact that people were using different calibrators. Of course, if you use a different material for that calibration, you would get different results, just like the ones that were shown in the last slide. So uh, the released international standard in 2010 came from the National Institute of Biological Standards and Controls. It's called the WHO International Standard. And it is, quote, assigned a concentration of IU units uh, based on testing in a number of laboratories. So what happens is the samples for all of the viral load assays get sent out and are tested in a variety of different technologies and then an average of copies per mil is then taken generally as the international standard expressed in I units, IU units. So based on this worldwide collaboration, uh, material is created. And then a next important point is that the WHO has really done a great job in having this material uh, be uh, very robust, both in shipment and also over time. So it's lyophilized. And as soon as you go into a quality lyophilization environment, take the water away, uh, uh, then the stability of all kinds of samples, including these uh, viral samples, becomes tremendous. We have uh, uh, just lyophilized vials, I'll just say as an aside from the WHO, in other areas of testing that we've had for over 10 years, and we essentially get the same results as we come back and them, apply them to real-time PCR testing. Now, a final important point is shown at the bottom of the slide is the, that this build that the WHO does that people can start calibrating to is not going to serve all of the clinical testing community's needs. People are going to be recalibrating their laboratory development tests. This is going to happen for IVD assays as well. So we really need to have a, a much greater supply of secondary standards. And these secondary standards need to very closely match the primary standard. So that fortunately, at this point in time, it wasn't always the case. There are a lot of available standards. And you can see this top bullet, some of the existing standards that are there. And I won't comment on any of them. I think these are all uh, terrific companies that are doing a great job with secondary standards for CMV. Uh, more recently, uh, there's been a application of technology beyond quantitative PCR for matching the primary standard to the secondary standard, and that has been digital PCR. Digital PCR, as many of you know, has a greater capacity to, for accuracy than qPCR and in addition represents a direct counting of molecules and obviates the needs for generation of a standard curve when you compare one sample to another. So here are two examples of digital PCR for those of you not familiar with it. The top one is the type of PCR done in an emulsion setting. But the point is that a dilution series is done into an array format, either in liquid or on a solid surface, as is illustrated in the bottom panel. 
And at a certain dilution and at a certain density of the array, you will be able to count individual wells. And what's going on in those individual wells is that, let's take CMV as an example, there are PCR primers that can amplify any single molecule that is occupying that well, uh, and after a certain number of amplification cycles, we'll see that it's positive. So literally, at the end of the day, individual molecules are diluted, they fall into a wells, they're amplified and detected, and it's like counting jelly beans in a jelly bean bottle. The attributes of this testing compared to PCR certainly are that the precision of testing is improved. Uh, the measuring range, however, which illustrated in the top right slide is very, very broad for qPCR, is array dependent. The larger the array, the greater the measuring range, but in general, uh, certainly limited than qPCR. The important third point is the lack of need for an external calibrator. We are just directly counting molecules. Uh, and so one of the things going forward to think about is will we eventually get to the point where we're not talking about samples being sent out to different laboratories measured by qPCR, but in fact just directly counting uh, control material uh, by digital PCR and having that count equal our international unit. So, with the advent of WHO standards, did we fix the problem? And there's lots of literature on this, but I think a useful way is to take the very, very broad surveys that almost all of us subscribe to from the College of American Pathology and just ask what happens when you take proficiency samples and send them around to a variety of laboratories that are using a variety of technologies. So shown in the green line, uh, is uh, a set of assays, uh, and without naming them, I'll say these are assays that are very well characterized, and uh, in this green line set uh, are uh, reiterations of testing with, in fact, exactly the same assay in many cases. And if we look at the low value, the high value, and the median value, the numbers are very tight. And in fact, they get fairly close to what PCR is capable of. If, however, we look in the orange box, which includes all methods, we can see that in 2015, there are great differences between the low values and the high values, uh, and a drift in the median value even a little bit. Finally, for this slide, the left blue box shows that uh, uh, as of 2015, we had reporting in international units, but also reporting in copies. And I can tell you that as a strong incentive for laboratories to be reporting in international units only, uh, directing uh, their attention to the importance of calibrating to this material, uh, uh, recently, the uh, reporting in copies has not been called for. So as a summary in 2017, here are some bullet points. There's been a widespread adoption of the WHO standard. There has been significant improvement in CMV tests, including both LDT and FDA-approved assays. There has been improvement in concordance of CMV results for tests calibrated to the WHO standard. However, significant reproducibility differences among different assays still remains. So the conclusion is that in 2017, despite all of these great efforts, we are still not there yet. So what went wrong? What have we been missing? Well, first, this is a complicated process. It's not like digital PCR, where you count wells on an amplification microarray and calculate the result. For PCR, you must calibrate to a well-characterized standard material. So for both LTDs and IVDs, even with experienced developers, calibration might not be done in exactly the same way. Secondly, there could be variation in secondary standards, and indeed examples of this have come to light. And finally, let's remember that variation in test chemistries including extraction, selection of probes and primers, 
and the test instrumentation itself could contribute to variation. So very quickly, the status of secondary standards, and I'll just uh, uh, cite this excellent article uh, that appeared in 2014 using digital PCR. The boxes in the right show uh, a NIST top right product, which is actually uh, raw naked DNA that has been incredibly well calibrated and quantified as well as can really be done with, uh, with large size cytomegalovirus nucleic acid. And then uh, an in-house assay and the WHO standard. And you can see that all of three of those fall pretty much on top of each other. You can see that one of the standards at the time, and I believe uh, this is no longer the case, uh, but at least one of the standards at this time had a significant difference uh, from the concordance seen in the other three uh, panels. Uh, at the bottom of the slide, I've just thrown in data from this paper to show that digital PCR, until it gets down to very, very low concentrations, really is capable of much lower CVs and very, very uh, impressive reproducibility of testing. A second uh, example to cite is actually looking at FDA-approved tests. So we have uh, two tests that are calibrated to each other, shown in the bottom left panel. Uh, and then you can see that in that initial validation, first test out, and then the second test gets calibrated to it, there is very, very good concordance. But then when different materials are used to test in, again, a CAP survey, you can see that there are differences in these two tests in the mean uh, viral load for the challenge samples. So this hints uh, that something else is going on. And without going into the resolution of this particular problem, let's just consider a similar observation is seen when we compare these two FDA assays. Overall, they had good correlation, but their patient bias ranged from 0 0.4 to greater than 1 log. And their average bias was 0 0.76 log that are other things that could be going on. And in this case, there really are important hints, as a couple of really nice review papers have pointed out. So uh, scientists stand on each other's shoulders, and earlier work sometimes isn't resurrected, and uh, its importance considered. But that really has happened in the case of the CMV story. So one of the pieces of information we're thinking about is that when we take the plasma sample, uh, it really is not the infectious sample. Uh, that's been known for a long time in the setting of transfusion and, and other biological settings. So uh, CMB replicates in leukocytes, and so if we want to find intact viruses, we know for sure they're in leukocytes. It's another question whether they're actually present in this sample type we call plasma. Secondly, all the way back in 2002 in this paper by Boom and colleagues, there was documentation that CMB DNA in the plasma actually has as its major form fragmented DNA. So there's C CMB DNA, not only is it fragmented, but by using two different PCR amplicons, and asking what percentage of signal came up in these different amplicons, it was estimated that a large fraction of this was quite small, less than 2,000 base pairs. Of course, it's very challenging to very finely fractionate that. Uh, but this study was done all the way back in 2002. So it really challenges this widespread assumption that we've had in our minds doing viral load testing for a long time, that we take a plasmid sample, inside it is, in the plasmid is an intact virus, we need to extract in order to break that virus open, that what pops out is large genomic DNA, we do PCR on it, we amplify and detect and get, expect to get the same results from lab to lab if we've standardized well to a, a commutable, commutable standard. So the other hypothesis that these early hints really strongly suggested were that uh, the 
size fragmented material shown in the right hand side as three different general size fragments, if presented to a PCR test uh, uh, shown at the bottom, could actually not be amplified the same way a large genomic piece of DNA would. Uh, the upstream and downstream primers shown in lime green here will amplify a large fragment. PCR tests in the past have sometimes been 200 nucleotides separating upstream and downstream primers. These days, the primers tend to be a little closer to each other. But still, you can imagine that depending on how small the average size fragment is in plasma, a significant amount of nucleic acid in the plasma sample would not be amplifiable. And then the most important point is that if we have different laboratories using different PCR tests with different separations of upstream and downstream primers, then we would automatically and strongly predict that we would have non-comparable results. And so there are a set of studies that have come out just in the last couple of years that have addressed this question for CMV straight on. So this paper came out in the fall of last year in which very focused experiment was done taking 10 PCR tests, comparing them directly to the WHO International Standard Panel, which is a dilution series of samples shown on the left. And if you look at the observed versus expected for the 10 different samples, the slide may a little be a little bit difficult to see all of the details there, but you can see for sure that there's separation of, of the different assays. And then plotted on the right, uh, in order of the size of the amplicons going from small on the left to larger on the right are the results uh, and the separation of values compared among these different uh, assays. So not only is there a separation, but in some cases there are even dropouts. So I really recommend this paper for those of you who are interested in this topic. It includes not only this very, very important and really definitive information about what's going wrong uh, with our PCR standardization for CMV, but there's a tremendous discussion that looks back on the background and really puts it in uh, its proper clinical setting. Uh, in terms of the reportable tests, here's just a third panel from the same paper showing that results that would be reported out from a test really would vary uh, uh, from test to test. So let's begin to wind down a little bit and just uh, think about, uh, as you're listening to this webinar, what would be your next experiment? So, and I've just thrown up a couple of possibilities here. I mentioned that in 2002 there was an initial rudimentary characterization of the circular DNA. Uh, we learned from that study that nucleic acid was fragmented and it tended to be small. Uh, the problem with looking at the nucleic acid and having your experiment be to go look and see exactly what the size fragments are Remember, these are present in such small concentrations, you need things like PCR to even know that they are there. So you need either some kind of hybridization to do your experiment um, or some sort of a new technology, but you need a way to actually look at those fragments to clearly define the size distribution. So looking at the distribution is a tough experiment. And uh, so beyond uh, looking at size distribution, the experiment that is much more straightforward to do and was just published this last summer was to go in and do the very simple experiment of asking if it's extra viral, then we ought to be able to make it go away by nucleasing it farther so that no PCR reaction can pick it up. And so that's illustrated here, back to our size distribution. In this experiment, samples were extracted, and then they were treated by a powerful DNA treatment, uh, and then this was plugged into various PCR assays. 
And this uh, paper that just came out in the Journal of Infectious Disease uh, with Tong and colleagues uh, took primers uh, that would create amplicons of different size, 81 base pairs, 138 base pairs, 578 base pairs for two different targets uh, with even two more primer sets, and then asked what was the amplifiability. And the results were really, really dramatic. I'm just showing one of the result slides from this paper, which I also recommend highly uh, that you look at. And that is that uh, a very, very large number of samples, by far the, the greatest number of samples here, uh, after nuclease treatment, had no amplifiable nucleic acid at all. So this just definitively shows that in a typical CMB plasmid sample, in fact, most of the nucleic acid is this very, very small, freely circulating nucleic acid. So the major conclusions then are that that most is really more than 99%. The distribution is quite small, and a proportion of it, in fact, is very small, less than 138 base pairs. Um, an additional experiment that was done was to, uh, knowing that it's free nucleic acid, to look at uh, pre-analytic conditions again. They've been looked at over the years, of course, but their assessment in this paper was that the free DNA is stable up to 48 hours pre-separation from white cells. Finally, and I recommend this paper to you as well, that was one that was initiated by Randy Hayden and others who have Oh, I, I can't name all the names of people who have been instrumental in doing this work, uh, Angie Caliendo and the other uh, authors that I've shown today. But looking back at CAP samples, not just for CMV, but also looking for Epstein-Barr virus and other viruses, um, looking at the reported values and documenting the fact that this is really a generalized problem for other areas of testing as well. So to summarize. Most plasmid CMV DNA is naked, it's extraviral, it's substantially processed. Uh, it's vulnerable then to the vagaries of different targeted PCR uh, designs. Different assays give different results depending on their amplicon size. And this uh, applies to all pathogens likely detected in the plasma. So what do we do in the absence of a fix for this? Well. You know, I think maintaining, and I certainly would recommend, I think most people would recommend maintaining standardization to WHO, but recognize the fact that different assays will have this problem of non-commutability for the reasons that we've outlined today. Um, so uh, monitoring the patient's clinical course using the same assay is one way to assure that at least we have comparative values for the same patient during the same tre treatment scenario, which has really been a recommendation in general for quite a period of time. So what about digital PCR going forward? Well, I think an important thing to remember is that even digital PCR is capable of direct counting if we have fragmented nucleic acid that is too small for the amplicons of that digital PCR test, they will not be detected. So we cannot just commutably go from digital PCR test to digital PCR test. Um, perhaps digital PCR assays that have very, very uh, small amplicon sizes or if they were standardized in some way and did direct measurements, in fact, would be a powerful powerful form of testing going forward. Uh, digital PCR also has some throughput issues, uh, but uh, this could be something that's very important going forward. We can imagine missing nucleic acid technologies. Uh, in addition to digital PCR of small amplicons, what about wholly new technologies? I mean, after all, we have technologies like next-gen sequencing where nucleic acids go through a nanopore, and not only the detection of that nucleic acid fragment, even if it's very small, but a sequence for it is rendered in the detection. And we have other assays where we increasingly reduce the noise problem and we're able to sensitively hybridize with single 
probes of very, very small size. Perhaps technologies like this will really be our final solution down the road. Certainly, clinical testing going forward will be tremendously impacted by these studies that I've described to you today. With the knowledge of the non-commutability of samples, what will we do? Will we have different assays with different specific cutoff levels? Uh, will they be population specific as well as we continue to do more and more studies? Uh, will tests eventually converge on the same targets and the same amplicon sizes? Or will we have these new breakthrough technologies? Certainly, what everybody will agree with now and going forward is that new clinical studies with full appreciation of the need for well-standardized PCR testing will need to be done. And so with that, I'd like to thank the sponsors of this teleconference, Abbott Laboratories, and thank you all for your attendance today. Thank you, Dr. Hillier, for this very informative presentation. Before we get started on the q and I just want to remind everybody that you can submit your questions by clicking on the Q&A button on the left-hand screen of um, your window, your presentation window. Okay, here we go with the first question. During your presentation, you discussed that given with the WHO standardization, we still um, don't have full harmonization of the assays. In your opinion, what would it take for that to occur? Well, no matter what technology um, you're talking about, we really have a, a tough challenge here. And I think that uh, the solutions that come to mind, I, uh, Authors of this paper have uh, brainstormed this, and uh, we talk about it as we teach our residents here at the University of Utah. And, you know, one solution would be to have some sort of a correction factor among assays. I think that's not very attractive. The data that we see uh, so far suggests that amplicons of about the same size will be pretty commutable, but there's many, many targets for all of our uh, viral assays. CMV is a large virus, and uh, tests have already been rolled out and validated. So having um, everyone use exactly the same amplicon could be a solution, but that's also not a very attractive one. I'll just add also that we don't know a lot about uh, different patients and to what extent their nucleic acid is fragmented. Could it be at different stages of disease? In fact, we see a different size distribution of fragments. So frankly, it's really a tough nut, and I, I don't have a great solution. Uh, the points that have been made about following the patient with the same assay, you know, generally stand, standardizing to secondary standards are the important ones that come to mind for me for the time being. Okay. Thank you. Second question is, you mentioned that digital PCR may be, a suitable herpes, um, may be suitable for quantification of herpes virus. Can you elaborate on pros and cons between digital PC, PCR versus real-time currently used um, in FDA-approved assays? Yeah, so let's assume that uh, we had commutability and uh, digital had uh, been appreciated for some of its uh, good ability to be very, very reproducible. Uh, there's still problems with this platform. It, it's used for many, many different applications. In these research studies, it's been absolutely key. But it's in its current format, it just doesn't have the convenience uh, and the long track history that qPCR has. qPCR, of course, uh, we're, we have such a command of that. If you look at CAP studies for a test with the same assay and look at the CVs for that, it's really a, a tremendous technology going forward. So we'll wait and see. Technology and technology companies surprise us. But right now, we just don't have sort of the same cost effectiveness, the same throughput, and the same confidence that we're not going to have problems as we do with qPCR. Um, the next question is, current sensitivity of commercially available CMV assays is the low end of the dynamic range. Um, how does that sensitivity impact patient management, and does it? 
Okay, well, the three FDA-approved tests go down pretty low. Uh, and I hope I made the point well that although we don't have an absolute cutoff as a trigger point for initiating therapy, the ballpark for most initiations of therapy tends to be 1,000, 1,500, 2,000. And so that's a big separation between the sensitivity of these tests. Also, you read the literature for the laboratory developed tests. They're also very, very low. So in terms of sensitivity, uh, the way algorithms are used right now, none of the PCR tests have a sensitivity problem. Is there significant demand for primary sequencing to detect variants or perhaps drug-resistant markers? In the case of CMV, that's a very, very important uh, issue. Um, and the number of targets and the expanding number of drugs makes this a, a dynamic process. Uh, as one takes a patient who's on therapy in current practice and sees that on therapy, akin to what we see on a patient on HIV therapy, and there's a rebound to a higher viral load, then the standard of care is to do um, resistance testing. Right now it's done mostly by Sanger sequencing, although a number of laboratories are very, working very, very hard to develop next-gen sequencing assays. Um, I'll just throw in another challenge there, same as we've seen for HIV, is that having a curated, well-curated set of uh, mutations so that we know what the correlation and the outcomes are uh, is a significant issue, and um, labs, fortunately, are working with each other to make this kind of information accessible to the whole uh, community of testers. Is there clinical value in understanding potential difference between viron-free DNA and plasma versus intact virons? And could this potentially be, uh, you know, an impact or cause effect between somebody being on therapy versus um, somebody not being on therapy? I think it's just so too early to tell. We, we just, as I mentioned, don't know what the size distribution is. I think that the good assumption is that uh, cells are infected with viruses and it's not just CMV. We need to start asking what's going on in EBV, other herpes viruses, and just infections in general where we do quanti quantitation. But uh, as soon as, uh, and maybe even before nucleic acid is released from cells, uh, the integrity of the virus is vulnerable and um, We've seen over the years as we try to take plasma fractions and to culture with them that culture is really difficult. That's another early hint that we had that what we're seeing in our PCR assays is not really the presence of intact virus. So I think with this information, there'll, there'll be initiation of sort of next generations of looking at pathogenesis of viruses and and uh, uh, what is the integrity of the virus in different body compartments? Uh, you know, you, you can't ask those questions until you have the tools to do them. We're beginning to at least uh, have some experience with some of the first generation tools for detecting uh, free nucleic acid, but it's in its infancy. Thank you, Dr. Hilliard. We're coming on top of the hour, so I want to be mindful of that. If there are no more questions, I would like to once again thank Dr. Hilliard for his presentation, and thank you all for your attendance today. As a reminder, today's webcast will be available on demand viewing through six, for six months from live dates. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when the webcast will be available for replay. Thank you all for your attendance today, and goodbye.